Kicked off President Joe Biden's first address to Congress. Madam Speaker, Madam Vice President. No president has ever said those words from this podium. No president has ever said those words. And it's about time. In front of an intimate audience gathered in the House chamber, President Biden declared America is ready for takeoff and outlined a very ambitious plan to make sure that nobody is left behind. Bronx Congressman Richie Torres in the room where it happened, and he joins us this morning to share his thoughts on the address. Good morning to you, Congressman. Thank you for being here. Good morning. It's an honor to be here. Congressman, first I want to begin with a picture that you tweeted last night. Saw this as it was happening from the chamber, okay? Throw that picture up, everybody. You got to see this history in the making, in person, right? A view from above, an eagle-eye view. What was that moment like for you? It was overwhelming for me. And, you know, it was unusual because we were socially distanced and there were far fewer attendees than usual. So only the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, only two cabinet members, the Defense Secretary and the Secretary of State, and then only 200 members of Congress were permitted to attend the State of the Union. And I was enormously fortunate to be one of them. And I felt like I was witnessing the emergence of a 21st century FDR. It was an inspirational mm -hmm. speech. Wow, yeah, only 200 people. Usually it's around 1,000 people in the chamber. Now, last we spoke with you talking about being in that chamber, you said it, you were scared, obviously, because that's when we saw the riots break out there. And, and I want to ask you, what was it like being back there this time, especially knowing what you had experienced before. It was deeply gratifying. I felt the weight of history on my shoulder. And, you know, I'll echo the sentiment of the president himself. America is on the move again. You know, he's making the most comprehensive investments um, that we've seen in more than a half a century. And my view is, and he spoke briefly about withdrawing troops from Afghanistan. But my view is if we can, you know, if we can spend trillions of dollars on wars in the Middle East, then why can't we invest trillions of dollars here at home mm. in our own people, in our own infrastructure? And, and that's the foundation of the president's life. Yeah, and, and I just think for you also, to think about the history you made when becoming a congressman, being in that room, seeing two women up there on the dais in those two chairs as well. But I do want to get to the speech itself. President Biden presented a very progressive plan to get America and Americans back on their feet. You just talked about some of it, right? That $1.8 trillion price tag which does include increased social programs, a family plan that would extend health care, child care and education to those who can't afford it, which would then be paid by tax increases on the wealthy. So some of that did not sit well with Republicans. I want to play a snippet of their reaction and get your take. It's a liberal wish list of big government waste, plus the biggest job killing tax hikes in a generation. Experts say when all is said and done, it would lower wages of the average American worker and shrink our economy. $1.8 trillion is a bit of a sticker shock for them, right? So what will it take to get the plan through Congress? Well, I would advocate putting the plan through reconciliation, which is exempt from the filibuster. But, you know, America has been plagued by decades of disinvestment. You know, a country that refuses to invest in itself is planting the seeds of its own decline. Investment in the United States has fallen by 40 percent uh, since the 1960s. And so we have to invest in our infrastructure in order to be productive and innovative at home and competitive abroad. We have to strengthen our families with greater access to child care and paid leave. I'm particularly excited about the president's proposal for expanding education beyond the traditional K to 12 model. He's proposing uh, pre-K for every three-year-old, every four-year-old, as well as two years of free college that would enable people to either obtain a college degree or certification. Um, and then he's putting a premium on supporting our children, um, whether it's expanding the child tax credit, which would cut child poverty in half, or early education, you know, mm -hmm. lifting millions of children out of poverty and exposing them to early childhood education will have benefits that will last a lifetime. It will change the trajectory of millions of children in America. 
Yeah, there's a lot of investment that he talked about. I also want to discuss some of the other protections that he mentioned, including um, gun legislation. He talked about background checks, assault weapons bans, ghost guns, um, and getting guns out of the hands of abusers. But he also talked about uh, transgender rights, police reforms. Let's take a listen to some of what we heard. We've all seen the knee of injustice on the neck of black Americans. Now's our opportunity to make some real progress. The vast majority of men and women wearing a uniform and a badge serve our communities, and they serve them honorably. I know them. I know they want to. So specifically, I want to ask you, what is the likelihood that the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act will get fast-tracked and passed by the time of the one-year anniversary of his death, which is, what, less than a month from now? Well, I know that we are in the process of negotiating the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act with um, Republican Senator Tim Scott in the Senate. Um, you know, my view is that the abolition of qualified immunity has to be non-negotiable. Uh, the, the central problem of American policing is the lack of accountability. And where there is no accountability, there will never be an end to police brutality. And qualified immunity enables police officers to abuse their power without facing accountability in a court of law. And that has to be abolished. And that's a non-negotiable for me. So you think it's going to happen quickly? Um, you, we could pass some version of police reform, but there's an attempt by the Republicans in the Senate to remove the qualified immunity provision, yeah. and I strongly oppose those attempts. That's yeah. a non-negotiable. And we keep talking I, about I that. will not vote for a legislation that fails to abolish qualified immunity. Understood. We keep talking about that term, qualified immunity, here on the Pick 7 Morning News. Congressman Richie Torres, always appreciate you making the time for us. Thank you for being here. Good to see you.